everybody, welcome to Audition Perform's first webinar for 2018. I have with me here today Gary Levinson, the Senior Associate Principal Concertmaster of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. And we're so pleased, Gary, that you can join us on this inaugural Audition Perform in Chichester this summer. Uh, I'm particularly thrilled that you're coming because I know how many violinists come to you um, from all over America um, needing help with auditions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of people that approach you for help? Of course, I'm delighted to join you. It's one of my favorite places, Chichester University. What little I saw of it was fantastic. And I know all of our students that will be there will be really thrilled with the facilities and with the idyllic atmosphere that's there. Um, to answer your question, not only in the America, but really all over the world, I get pretty much the same question with respect to auditions. And I hasten to add that auditions are not just orchestra auditions, they're also chamber music auditions, they're also international competitions. Oftentimes, if you're applying for a teaching job, you have to play a recital. So in many ways, it's how to get the best out of your playing under pressure, which is what a performing musician does to begin with. Um, and I think a lot of the things that they say uh, that unite them is, you know, what do we do with performance anxiety? How do we stop and start, like in an orchestra audition, for example, in the matter of 10 minutes, you might have to play classical repertoire, 20th, 20th, 21st century repertoire, maybe Bach, something like that. And it's very difficult because from the, the conservatory stage, we really don't get trained on how to, you know, basically what we used to call drop the needle, you know, start like a CD, stop like a CD. So um, it's, it's a lot of mental preparation and it's really knowing what to do while you're playing because I think a lot of students and even young professionals, they get scared of the unknown. And what I try to teach them is what to do to sort of set the unknown aside um, and give them a plan so they can play their very best, so they can play with inspired playing. So how might one of those plans look for one of those people? Well, let's take an orchestral lecture, for example. So if the, if the first thing I say to my students is, why do you think the committee wants to hear this excerpt? And that's a very important question because I would say nine out of 10 never even think about it. You know, if it's the last movement of Mozart 39, if it's the first page of Don Juan, they just know it's being asked, but they never think about what are the skills that the committee is really listening for. You know, if you're going to Let's take Mozart 39. Most of it is 16th notes. Most of it is off the string. It's facility, you know, but if you're going to be thinking about your tone production, which is great, you should think about tone production all the time. That's not the excerpt to focus on tone production. You want to think about coordination. You want to think about phrasing. You want to think about, you know, some kind of dynamic range, but it's not going to be the same um, as a, a slow, like let's say the opening of Brahms 1. So the first thing I tell them is ask yourself what is the primary, um, the, the principal thing that they're looking for, and then make sure that you can display that to the best of your ability. And what about general repertoire for an audition? So the solo repertoire, the concertos, what are common problems which you come across with people who haven't prepared well for these things? Well, the common problems, of course, are rhythm. Um, oftentimes they'll play, at least in the United States, I find a lot of them are afraid of playing with great contrast. They think somehow it would be insulting, uh, which I find very interesting because anytime you play sort of static dull, that is, in my opinion, the most insulting thing you can do to the committee because you're neither serving the music, the composer or the committee, you know, you basically at best, they'll be asleep for you, which is not what you want to hear. Um, and certainly not the, the reaction you want to elicit as a player. So um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with rhythm and dynamics. The other thing is has to do with the way they approach the instrument, which may be a little unusual for people. Um, people don't really think that if they're good at the instrument, that they should show that. So I think sometimes they want to hide that. And I think it's actually a, a wonderful asset. If you feel that your arpeggio playing is really great, go for it. There's no reason to uh, be shy about it. I mean, let's face it, you know, an audition of any kind is really your showing the people listening to you what you know how to do. Um, so I think it's in many ways, you do need to be a bit of an extrovert, even if naturally you're an introvert. And what about people who don't feel that their arpeggios are wonderful and, and want to show them off? We know that they're good, but they feel they're not. Maybe those kind of people that constantly criticize themselves how do you get them to come out of themselves and at least give the impression that they're cocky and confident? 
Right. Let's divide that in two levels. Sometimes if a, if a candidate thinks they're not good, they're right. <laughs> so let's face it, maybe they should work on their arpeggios. I get a lot of students, even graduate students, and if I ask them, what is your warm-up routine, they give me a blank look. They don't have a warm-up routine. They may tune the violin, and then they jump right in. You know, it's the problematic thing, which I think, let's say, 100 years ago would have been unthinkable. There's no pedagogue, certainly from the Russian school, that would even let you stay in their studio if you couldn't play every scale, every arpeggio, Gavinier, that stuff, you know, by memory. I remember um, the great Joseph Gingold. I mean, he could play any student concerto by memory, even in his late 70s, because it was so ingrained in his body. That's kind of a let's say the routine has been lost. I don't want to say the skills are lost, but the routine has been lost. So I would say the first thing you do is if you feel that your weak point is arpeggio playing, your double stop playing, whatever it is, you should address it. Um, the, the advice I give uh, most uh, candidates for auditions is you can't hide in an audition. The notion that you only play for a few minutes, you know, a good committee will be able to see through whatever it is that you learned and what you don't know how to do. So the best thing you can do is be a complete musician. Don't cheat, learn the music, know the music, know what's around you. If you just know your part, God forbid, you'd have to actually sit in the orchestra for a trial week, and then what? Then all of a sudden you're gonna have to cram? Not such a good idea. The other thing is, is that if you are in fact good at our example, the arpeggio, but you feel like you're not, then you really want to have certain places where you can be comfortable. So for example, I have, several students that don't feel comfortable playing in upper positions. I have them start in upper positions all the time. If they say, I don't like playing in fifth position, you start in fourth and you go all, all the way up to the nosebleed positions. So it's really putting yourself in the worst position so that on, on the audition day, when you play your very worst, that worst is much higher than it used to be, right? Your Indeed. Is that much more secure? Right, but, but also I would say that you actually raise your technique by shining a light on what scares you. And that's one of the reasons why I say to people, well, what is this excerpt about? What is this section about? Because what you want to really tell them is to say, if you really, the answer is, I don't know, you should be very frank about it. If the answer is, I don't know, go out and find out. Find out from your, your friends, from, from your teachers. Go watch a great video. Medici is a great source. YouTube is a great source. But do your homework. The idea that you can sort of fake your way through it is not a good policy. So if you're meeting a student um, or a, a young professional or an old professional who is um, going for an audition and they need help with their excerpts, mm. and they don't know where to start. I've come across a few people who say, really, how do I even begin to, to learn how to do this properly? What are your top four tips for them? What would be the first four things you would do on receiving an excerpt that you don't know? You don't know the piece at all. You don't know the excerpt. What would be the first four things you would do? Well, the first thing I would do is I would take my calendar and I would find out how much time I have until I have to play. Um, and the reason for that is oftentimes people think they have, I, mean, I can tell you an example from last summer without using a name because it's a pretty famous person, but they said, you know, I can learn anything in three weeks. Um, and <laughs> I said to them, if that's true, you better drop everything and play at least nine hours a day because this is going to take longer than three weeks. Um, you need to figure out if it's something that is technically challenging or musically challenging or both and how much time, well, let's put it this way, the people who know this excerpt inside out would need to relearn it and restudy it. The other thing I would do is study the score, then maybe listen to a video of it. But really start with the score. Oftentimes people just do it by ear um, and God forbid they would happen on a, on a video. Um, perfect example, if, if, if you've never heard of a late Tchaikovsky symphony and you happen on a, happen on a recording of Bernstein uh, with New York Philharmonic, which I was actually on in his last year of his life, the tempi are crazy. And so if that's the only recording you've ever heard of that late, of that late um, Tchaikovsky symphony, you're not gonna know the tempo of any of it because the slow is way slower and the fast was really, really crazy fast. So what we, what we try to do um, is put the, the students in a position where you have at least two or three videos, recordings, whatever you want, um, of named ensembles and conductors. 
that you really kind of know from the score and then from performance practice what's expected.